Welcome everyone to uh, the EBIT uh, Research Seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce Pablo Estorio, an economist and uh, senior research fellow here at EBIT. He's going to be presenting his uh, work, the, A Story of Two Tales, which builds on his already quite substantial research on uh, uh, economic inequality and economic growth, especially in Latin America. So without further ado, I think it over to you. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you very much for everybody to have come to the seminar. Um, so I'm going to be primarily talking about that, what is in that title, yeah, which is more than going research, and I'm going to be presenting some, uh, some new findings yeah, on, on, the, on that idea of tales and shares. But also I would like to put these, uh, those findings in a more general, a broader uh, context of my own research and also on the study of inequality in Latin America in the longer term. Okay? So I'm going to start with that. Just going to give you a, an idea of a perspective here. Uh, so these are, generally speaking, that if we look at that timeline since the co uh, colonial time period, yeah, up to today. Yeah? So we got a definite sort of epochs when we think about inequality in Latin America. Of course, there is a, a colonial period, yeah? And this is where the institutionalist approach is focusing on, yeah, in trying to explain what happened in Latin America at present and in a very recent uh, history. So they look at this, and I don't to explain that, okay? But of course, this is not all that there is, yeah? And so we know that after the colonial period, we got very important uh, developments, transformations happening in Latin America, all of them with uh, a potential to impact on inequality. So of course, we got post-independence, which is basically civil wars and a period of disorder. Yeah? And then more or less, the, the region started to regain some stability and order by the time of the starting of the first globalization, around 1870. Yeah? And then we got this new post-independence, very defined period, which is export-led growth under that first globalization, basically based on the commodities. Then that is followed by a period of transition of the depression, yeah? uh, and then we start this second period, which is called the state-led industrialization or import substitution industrialization period, yeah? which is the middle period around 1940s to 1980s, Toward the end, you can think about the late 1970s in countries like Argentina and Chile, the debt crisis for, for, for the others, for most of the others. And the starting point, it could be in the mid 1930s in some countries. Yeah, but more or less, the, the core of that period is in 1940, 1980, and then we go to the more recent period, again, after a, the debt crisis, a, a structural reforms, Washington Consensus, and this is another period of export-led uh, growth under yeah, the second globalization. And then finally, we got the commodity boom years. Yeah, that more or less 2003, 2013, 14. Yeah? Um, how are <coughs> the, the, as we want to know about the longer term in Latin America, what sort of evidence is available? Yeah, what instruments do, do we have in order to know what happened a along those different defined periods. Yeah? So we got social tables. Okay? Let's say we got social tables for the colonial period, focusing on, on land concentration, let's say. Okay? Social ta tables is a, a device to quantify the, the social structure. Yeah? Uh, grouping individuals along to some, some characteristic, let's say occupations. Okay? So, we got also social tables for the first globalization period and for the middle period. Yeah? Uh, those are based on censuses. Okay? So we go very uh, um, uh, very good works, particularly on, on social tables showing inequality in Uruguay and Chile. It's the work of, of Javier Rodriguez Weber. I think Branco was the examiner of that thesis. Um, but also we go on, on Brazil and Mexico. Uh, what else we got? Well, rent wage ratios, 
yeah, particularly for the first globalization, and what is called the Williamson ratio, which is the GDP per capita divided by the unskilled wage. Okay? So they are very, if you want, basic measures, but it cannot tell the whole story. Okay? And particularly, it cannot tell the whole story once you move into that period. Okay? Because now the economies are, are much more complex, huh? the structures are very much more, more complex. Yeah? And then there are a lot of new forces acting yeah, on those economies likely to, to have an impact on inequality. Um, for that period, we got the, uh, a, a lot of work by a vote Frank Emma. He was looking at wage shares and also intra-industry wage inequality. Very important if you want to know inequality uh, during industrialization. Yeah? But the vote basically is focusing on three countries. So, so it's Argentina, Chile, and Mexico. Okay. Uh, those studies, at most, you will have five countries at the most, yeah, the first period. Yeah. Uh, if you, when you talk about Latin America, if you have three countries, you're lucky. Okay. And that's what people call Latin America, particularly you know, <coughs> in those periods. Yeah. Three, uh, five countries, so that's uh, something. Okay. Uh, what else have we got here? Now, this following Piketty and, and Associates. We got, of course, now studies of the top 1%, looking at elites yeah, with fiscal data. And the main contributions here are by, um, in Argentina and Brazil. Uh, uh, Brazil is Pedro Sousa and Mark Morgan, Morgan who is in, in, in Paris. Argentina is, a, and I, I forgot the, the name of, it's a, a Spanish author. author. Well, I, I'll, I'll come to mine later, okay? So basically they're looking at income concentration mark more than income inequality, okay? More than income inequality. Al Alvaredo is the, the person working in Argentina. And then of course what you now, what we got for more recent periods is proper uh, official household budget surveys, yeah? After 1980, more or less com comparable and compatible across a lot of uh, uh, economies in the region. Yeah? Uh, so we got be much better data. Okay? A problem with those, but with that data, is they tend to underestimate the top of the distribution. Okay? The top of the, of the distribution. While probably you may have a better idea if you work with social tables here. Okay? Um, I, I'll comment on that a bit more later on. So that's, that's in terms of the data, gross model, what we got. Yeah. Now, what happened to inequality? What do we know? Well, we know that during the colonial period, it was a very high inequality, yeah. but not so high relative to other pre-industrial economies. Okay. But inequality was already high, high concentration of land. Yeah. Now they came this first globalization, and let's say the findings by people like uh, Jeffrey Williamson is, or, or Luis Bertola is showing rising inequality, rising inequality, yeah? Probably from a already high starting point. And then we come to this middle period, yeah? Which is where I'm going to be concentrating on. And then we don't know much about this, but we know that by the time of the 1980s, the debt crisis, when we start having a lot of information based on social service, inequality was very high all across Latin America. It doesn't matter Brazil, Bolivia, even Argentina, even low inequality, relatively low inequality countries such as Uruguay was already having high inequality. And then we got the more recent, the good news for the more recent period, the falling, the share, falling trend in inequality, basically associated with that commodity boom, yeah, that already came to an end 2014. So the more recent, uh, data coming out is showing probably the inequality in many countries are going up again, yeah, unfortunately. So as I, as I told you, we don't know much about what happened here. Yeah? And this is a period particularly relevant for inequality. And this is why we got all those structural and institutional transformations more or less happening there. Yeah? So everything that needs to do with inequality is here. Yeah? And I, I, it, I think people have, people have been paying more attention, of course, to this, to La Mita, like Comienda, and, and so on, or to this globalization, 
and less so relative, relatively to its importance to that middle period. Yeah. Of course, we got a lot of studies here. Yeah. So this is where I always try to look at. Okay. So the trans transformation very quickly. Yeah. So what we, we, if we just think that the starting point 1920s, yeah, and the ending point the 1980s, you will have, you know, in most of the countries in the region, going from rural economy to urban, agricultural based to manufacturing and services based economies, in terms of the geographic integ integration, loosely linked to integrated, okay, labor coerced, free wage free which wage, wage labor, yeah? Important developments in institutions, minimum wages, unions, all that happened during the 40s, 50s, 60s. And then uh, in education, illiterate, a population relatively educated, and then finally the demographic transition, high fertility, high mortality, low fertility, low mortality, okay? So those are these, those transformations, all of them are supporting different narratives. <coughs> in trying to explain inequality, okay? And that makes it very interesting, but also very complex, yeah? When you try to explain anything happening here, because you've got too many suspects here, yeah? And not always acting on the same, uh, with the same the direction, the effects on the same direction, and the timing may be different. So let me give you an example. Urbanization happened much earlier in uh, Argentina than in Brazil, okay? So uh, the timing is different there. Yeah? Organization, um, industrialization, the same, okay, and, and so on. Um, so what is the plan actually for today? So I want to try to give you some ideas of what we know that happened before the 1980s. Okay? And then I want to be concentrated on, on what happened at the top and the bottom of the distribution, okay, the tail. Okay? The tails and trying also to see if those trends are in any way related to the development strategies, which also in Latin America, when we talk about those strategies, are related to the structural transformation because they more or less coincide. Okay. Um, third point, I want to look at this what is called in uh, now in the literature Palma proposition which is basically is stating that whatever the country you are, if you look at the middle of the distribution, these aisles four to nine, okay, they all, always will get around 50% of total income, whatever the country you are. Okay, that's the, the proposition. And I want to look at what, over time, if that is consistent, yeah, with the data I'm going to be estimating. And say, finally, another, you know, sort of debate, <coughs> In Latin America, is a comparison, a concentration at the top, a comparison <coughs> between Latin American countries and the rich economies, the U.S. and the U.K. And then, of course, this is the work of Atkinson and Piketty, you know, estimating the top. I cannot, I cannot estimate top one percent. The only thing I could approach or you know, approximate is the top ten percent. You know, I cannot never go go to the top one percent, uh, but top ten percent is fine. When I talk, when I refer to Latin America, what I'm talking is about six countries, those, those countries. Yeah. It's a shame that Uruguay could be added, but it came too long, too, 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 too late in, in the process. Yeah. Uh, so I, I keep with those countries. The good thing is, concentrated on those six, is that I got a lot of data on determinants on those six countries over the whole century. Okay. I got a very rich database that I can explode in order to try to make sense of whatever inequality I, I can measure. Again, you know, the challenge here, inequality in Latin America not only, not, not only a problem because it's too high, it's a problem in terms of the estimation, the data, finding measures, how to, in order to explain first, you need to, to know what happened, to have some metrics, some estimation, some data. So that's the first task, yeah? Try to get some numbers, yeah? And, and not only get the numbers, the numbers need to be consistent uh, over time and comparable across the country. Yeah? In order for you to try to tell a story, yeah? which is a regional story more than a specific stories by country, yeah? which is what we have at the moment. So we know a lot about Chile, we know a lot about Uruguay, 
but then comparability is not always, always guaranteed. Yeah? So we need a sort of a glimpse of the whole story. Yeah? And that's, that's always my aim, is to try, with less information, try to say something about a, a, a larger group of economists. Um, so the starting point, I'm going to get, uh, tell you about previous results, and then moving to that more current issue for the estimation of the shares, top and, top, top and bottom, and then I'm going to show you some results at the, for the region, at the aggregate level, and then some conclusions. Yeah. Um, starting point is, I started with a, a sort of social, very simple social table, based on four uh, occupational categories, this is, by the way, is how, let's say, institutions like ECLAC or CEPAL, yeah, the UN Commission for Amer Latin America, a group, a, 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 the occupations, yeah? when they study this <coughs> inequality based on occupations. Yeah? So group one, employers, managers, professionals, group two, technicians, administrations, three, semi-skilled workers, think about construction, probably carpent carpenters, those largely in urban places, and then group four, rural, urban, and skilled workers, um, personal services, okay, uh, things like that, and skilled workers uh, uh, in, in the countryside. Um, so four groups, and we can have data on shares of the groups over at least 60 years of the centuries, and then we need to estimate that what happened earlier with other ways, okay. So, but we can have yearly observation, not, not yearly, on this every more or less 10 years, yeah? because they are usually based on censuses, okay? Um, you would wonder, why only four? Uh, yes, you can e expand up to 10 or 20. The problem is, the restriction is the data on income. Yeah, because if you add a new group here, you need to add a new income series. Okay, and that's a problem, that's a problem. Uh, no, the problem is not about the groups, not the people, it's about the income, okay? Which is the se uh, second stage here. What I do for income is I, I, I've been assembling wage series, yeah? For di uh, different uh, skills, uh, different education levels of, of, or skills, okay? So unskilled, semi-skilled, relatively skilled workers. And so I have wage series for those three workers, I have no series for the six countries consistently over the century for those, that's very difficult, yeah? So I, so I don't know about the professionals, let's say, highly skilled workers, but I calculate the way to close this, the whole estimation is to use total aggregate income, yeah? And then to calculate the income for group one as a receivable, okay? Once you go total income, and then you can subtract income from those three groups, and you get this receivable at the top. Um, the measure of income is going to be something close to house household income for the national accounts, okay? Uh, so there is a lot of estimation issues trying to approach that concept from the GDP series, particularly before the 1950s, okay? But I'm not going to get into those details, okay? Um, so that receivable, the important thing is that that receivable should capture property income. Yeah? Those three categories are dominated by labor income, yeah? but that one should include most of property income. Yeah? So in that way, I know that property income should be there, yeah? but also together some wages from professionals. Yeah? But they are there, okay? which is important. I also have done some checks in order to see if that makes sense, those <coughs> receivables make sense, and in, in general that makes sense. When I check with what, what the performance of um, operating surpluses in national accounts, let's say from 1930s from Argentina, or for high rank officials in government, and I calculate ratios, and they, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Let me show you some of the metrics you can calculate with, with that basic information, wages and, and Occupations. Yeah. First one is the very, very basic measure of inequality, which are the wage skill premiums. Okay. So if the group two wage divided by group four, relatively skilled, 
two and skill. Yeah? Nice thing is that I use only annual data. I not I don't need to estimate people because that's another round of estimation and, and pro pro probably errors. Yeah? And there is no interpolation, minimal interpolation, though I can do econometrics with that. Okay? On on annual series, which is very nice. Yeah. Um, also good to use those premiums is comparability with other studies. Rich and developing economy. So you have a metric that you can compare. Okay. Uh, I want to show you just the potential for the those wage premiums. This is a result from, from about two years ago. I already some of you are familiar with this, so my apologies. But here I'm trying to you see one of the good things of having that data set on those metrics on inequality is now you now make some comparison. Let's say for, for comparing the premiums with terms of trade. Terms of trade is the key macroeconomic variable for those economies, Latin American economies. Okay? So what you can see here, so you see now we can try to identify some patterns. Yeah? And which is striking here is that how influential terms of trade of trade uh, have been all along the, the last century in all the countries. You, you can see, for instance, in the case of Chile, how highly correlated the movements are associated of terms of trade, which is in yellow, and in the purple, which are the premiums. Okay? You see. If you see Mexico, there are positively positive correlation. Mexico, Chile, Venezuela. Yeah? And then we got two cases, negative correlation. Argentina, Colombia, and a mixed one. Brazil is positive correlation up to here, 1980. You know, Mercosur, I think, has to do something with that. And then it's negative correlation. Yeah? So this is a very interesting pattern. Yeah? And it still needs to be explained fully. Uh, it has to do something with the skill intensity in the export sector, probably, also in the non tradable sector. So when the, the government started to do spend the revenues from commodities. Yeah? But I need to look at more detail. They are, you know, wanting uh, an explanation. This is evidence that needs an explanation, but the evidence is there, and it wasn't there before. Okay? This is the only time I want to show you the six countries today. Okay? Now I want to be concentrated on those two. Okay? They tend to be con contrasting experiences <coughs> in Latin America. So when you think about Latin America, you can have the, those two opposites, Argentina and Brazil. Argentina can go together with Uruguay, okay? and Brazil, you put together, uh, Brazil together more with, let's say, Colombia as well. Okay? Um, those are the premiums. Another uh, metric, another measure that you, you can calculate with that basic four groups and the wage series, yeah, are between group genies, yeah, between group genies with the changing, uh, based on the labor force, economically active population, they are going to be changing over the, the, the period, yeah, as the economy develops, uh, uh, the education the levels improve, so there are going to be fewer people and skilled to education more with more skills and so on. So those shares are bound to be changing, okay? Which is a, a key difference from the genes you are used to, yeah? Which are fixed proportions of the population, yeah? But that, that allows just to calculate this the functional inequality. Because we know the profit, the properties are mostly at the top, income, uh, labor income, and the other groups. So you've got a rough idea of functional inequality, okay? property, uh, uh, labor, uh, capitalists, landlords, and, and workers, yeah? The problem is it's only between groups. So that's okay to show you some trends, but it's not good enough to show you levels. Because for levels, you will need within groups inequality, okay? What else? Well, it, it can shed light on things like structural change and changes in education, okay? Which is nice, okay? and also developments in the labor market, which is really nice as well, because you can say, well, was it any effect with introduction of minimum wages? Was it any impact of that or the unionization of the labor force? Was it important or not? In which countries? And so on. 
so we can show or try to capture those impacts with that, those genes. Those genes also can be divided into two genes can be between groups, can be constructed one of the four, four groups, and the other only concentrated on the lower three categories, wages only. Okay? And I want to show you how the results may be different between those two. Okay? They tend to behave differently, um, which is, well, it's not a surprise because you would expect the forces moving property income are different from the forces acting on labor income. So there have to be some differences. Yeah? Uh, so I'll show you the results. And then finally, which is more the concern of my current, current work, is about, you know, try to do something that I can relate to the top 10%, so the work from PKT, you know, those concentrations at the top, and also what Palma does, also putting the emphasis on the bottom 40%. You sometimes, 40, uh, bottom 40% can be also associated with poverty, okay? By the way, those two authors are always away, I mean, they don't, they dislike genes. Okay? They don't want genies. They try to look at shares. Okay? Um, so, let me compare now the, the result of my series with the, what the household surveys are showing. Okay? And that's Argentina, Brazil. These are, in purple, are the wage premiums. Okay? This, in green, is the Gini for the only the three labor categories, lower three categories, yeah, in green, and you so of course because by construction they need to be cor correlated because I'm using those wages to calculate this. Yeah. But which is more interesting is you see those are properly calculated genies, you know, fixed uh, fraction of the population for uh, the whole population. You know, so those official surveys, yeah, some of them probably not fully compar comparable with those, like those early estimations in Argentina. But you see the trend seems to be there. Yeah? Look at more the green and the <coughs> red triangles. Okay? And also look for the same here in Brazil. Yeah? So that green for <coughs> whatever simple as a measure is, can tell you something. It can cap capture some features of this pattern, those trends here in the properly calculated genes with official service, okay? So they are uh, moving together, but now what the other feature of those estimations is the contrast between what happened with labor income in green, okay, that's the gene between the three lower uh, occupations, mostly uh, labor, and we happen, what happens when you also take into account the top category, okay, the employers, the professionals, okay, and managers. Um, so you see they behave differently. They behave differently in, in Argentina, sometime in, sometimes in opposite ways, yeah. Uh, also in Brazil, you, you have common trends here, but not always, not always, okay. So there is a lot of diversity also needs to, needs to be explained. But this is something there that is telling you that uh, you need more than one measure to tell the story because they behave differently. You say if you only concentrate on the genie between genes of the full and the four categories, that story you can tell is different if you just look at labor income, yeah? which is something equivalent to just looking at the official genies. Uh, today's official, official genies which is mostly about labor income, as this chart shows you. This is recent data, 1995, 2013, <coughs> with all the surveys, okay? For the household surveys on 13 economies, including five of my group. And then they are showing you the skill premiums, okay? This is overall income, the full distribution, and this is only <coughs> labor income. And you see the, they are moved together. Yeah? So you don't add much information by considering the overall income once you have the labor income. And notice <coughs> that the difference here is minimal. Yeah? That gap is 0 0.51, 0 0.53. In terms of so 0.02, the difference. So they are not, it's 
this is an, an effect of the of the chart. They are very close. You say, basically, why? Well, because the household surveys underestimate property income, so they don't add much about labor income. Okay. So, uh, a point here to make is that if you take only this, you are going to miss a lot of the story, which is present in something like this. Okay and also which is going to be present in the, the series calculated, calculated with fiscal data. Okay? Because they basically try to address the underestimation of property income. Okay? Um, so this is all in terms of the general context. I want now to show you what I'm try, try, I'm doing now to estimate shares. Okay? Shares top 10%, bottom 40%. Um, so basically, the idea is to have some complementary measure metrics. Okay, apart from those genies, the premium, and then now try to look at, at shares with fixed f f f fractions of the population. Okay, and that makes it comparable with things that people do with uh, with the full distribution and the surface. Of course, they are not the same. They are different information. So I'm working for information people at work the service information people at home. And the service is what people tell you, tell income, okay? Uh, in the middle, it's not only, uh, you cannot separate semi skill with relatively skilled, this is a mix, okay? So that makes a problem when you try to explain things in terms of developments in the labor market, for instance, or education. So there is a, that's a problem, yeah? In terms of interpreting whatever comes out, the other problem is estimation challenge, and that's what I'm going to always tell you about. Uh, is there any water? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. I'm going to read very quickly over this, because, because basically it's a more technical part. So again, I want to get the top 10%, middle 50, bottom 40, and then Palma-like sort of ratio, top 10%, bottom 20, 40%. People like uh, Coban and Sumner, they say, well, this is a nice, me a, 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 an acceptable measure of inequality uh, to the extent that that happens, that instability in the middle 50%, okay? That more or less tells the information that a genie properly calculated can tell you, okay? And I know Branco is very critical on that, okay? So already he, he, he's written about that. Um, but I don't want to get into that debate. I just want to show you what comes out, okay? And so there's going to be, again, very, mind, very crude approximation of those shares. Uh, this is in a way of comparing the Gini and the Palma ratio for the UK, 1961-2012. You see, for that country over that period, well, they're more or less telling you the same story, okay? But of course, it's not going to be valid for all countries and all periods. Okay? Um, methodology. Well, the problem, the key problem is something that uh, Branco pointed out to me some months ago, the overlap issue. Okay? The problem is when you go those occupational groups and you put them together like in, on a line, they are not going to be perfectly sorted. Yeah? Because it could, could be, well, the case that somebody in group number four and skilled at the end of that group may be earning more than somebody at the beginning of group number two, okay? Or between two and three, the same. So they are overlap, overlapping incomes, yeah? And so that's a problem because anything you do in, to calculate those shares, you need that to be true, okay? O otherwise, it's not rigorous, you know? So we need to deal with that. I'm going to argue that in part that's going to be mitigated by the way of I need to reallocate people and by reallocating people I'm going to address in that already. Uh, and basically the estimation relies on this idea of the pen uh, income parade. Many of you may already be familiar with that. Um, I just want to pay attention to little people, not to the giants. And for the three lower occupational groups, that's a parade, okay? So it's like, like if you put a given population and then you 
measure them, then the size of the people according to their income, that you put them in a line. Well, this in that case is a parade, yeah? And then the ones with the lower income, the ones who, so the, the Bill Gates, the, this world here, and that's what you get, okay? So the goals up to all the way up to here, the little people, and then suddenly you go to the giants. And the giants seem to be on the top 10, ten actually the top 5%, or top, top 1%, those big guys. Yeah? What I'm going to be needing is to, have to say something on this part, which are the three occup lower occupation, occupational categories are here, okay, and try to avoid this for a reason I want to tell you soon, because they, they, are, they follow different distributions. Okay? And it's much difficult to find more data on dispersion on this group than on those groups, on those people. Okay? That's a made up example just to show you the sort of problems and estimation problem there is here. Let's say that you have full data. Okay? And then you divide, you have your groups here, the, the group four, three, two, one, and then you can draw, put all that data, and you can see that there are the overlap here, yeah, in, at the borders, yeah? So as I told you, somebody at the end of group uh, four may be earning more than somebody located at the beginning of group number three, okay? The same here. Here they tend to be a gap, yeah? and this is in recent data. That means that those here in the uh, group number one, em employers, managers, professionals, they tend to start ha having a, a, an income which is much higher than anybody at the end of group number three, technician, administration, clerks, people like that. Okay? This is already in data, uh, full data, recent, okay? this feature. So that's nice because I, in a way, can try to minimize, dealing with that is always a problem. Okay? So I want to concentrate here, and you see those uh, that's the information I the, the information I have. Okay, that's information I have. Uh, in this example, uh, let's say group uh, four is 50 percent of the population. Group three is about 30 percent. Group two is 15 percent. Group one, five percent. Just making an example, which is more or less reflects something which is common in my country. Yeah. So 15, 30, 15, five. And for each year, for each group, I, I have an average income, okay? This calculated as a receivable, okay? But those are based on wages, okay? With that data, I can calculate total income per group, yeah? And just the average times the, the number of people, and also between group genies, yeah? The between wage group genies, those three, and between four group genies, including that. So in between, okay? But that's not what I want is keep this 40%, keep the middle at 60% and the top at 10%, okay? So I need to move people, okay? I need to move people, I need to reallocate. Those at the end, the 40 to 50% of the group one, or group four, I need to move them to the middle. And those here, a bit, 5% of them, I need to move them to the top, okay? So that I can end up with the fixed sections here, 40, 50, 10, okay? And that's where the problem is. So I need to estimate, estimate the value of those chunks, okay? That's where the problem is. Uh, so what, what I did, um, okay, well, let me just work with a, uh, a distribution, full data, as I go to Brazil. This is the full distribution, 1995, the whole population. This is how it looks like. Okay, so these are, um, what is this? Income, yeah, and then, uh, let's say, percentile of the population, okay? I'm not putting all, all here because it would be too big and we'll look very small this, okay? So it's trunk it here, okay? I'm not showing the whole thing. The giants are not really there. Uh, but that's how it looks like. Now, as Branko mentioned the other day in the presentation of the book, we, this is well known that this follows a log normal distribution. The underlying population density function is 
log normal. Okay? Let's check that. That's it. Okay, that's log normal. Okay, in, in green. In green is a simulation. You only need, this is done in Excel, <coughs> you only need you only need to know the average of the original uh, series and the, and the standard deviation. And then you calculate this. This is log normal, you see it's a very nice closely fit for those. Okay, that's for the whole distribution. Let's try normal distribution. In blue, not good. Okay, the normal, assuming that the underlying population density function is normal, it doesn't work. Yeah? Now, okay, so not useful. But what about if you don't look at the, if you uh, say the giants, no, please, go somewhere else, okay? <laughs> go somewhere else. And you concentrate on the little people. Okay? And that's what I do here. This is the first 50% of that same distribution of Brazil, that's data, okay? Uh, and that's the size 70, the, the size 7 to 9, okay? And now I use log normal and see what happens. Not good. Huh? What about if I use normal? Okay, so this again, well known, the whole distribution follows log, log normal distribution. The little people, normality. So the all, all, all also nice thing is that the only thing I, in order to recreate the distribution, I, I need an, uh, an average of that fraction and some idea of the dispersion. Okay. This is, well, before most surveys, this is data from a social table, which is actually what I have, okay, social table. This is Chile, 19, 1957, um, and that's, this is the whole distribution of the unskilled workers only, okay, only the unskilled workers, equivalent to group number four. And again, this is the proper data, and that's no, assuming normality. So you see, you can recreate, more or less, with a good fit, you know, using the, the normality. And that's basically what I need to calculate those income of the people are going to be reallocating. Yeah? And of course, I also need dispersion yeah, for the groups. Yeah? That's something I basically, I can get some good idea of dispersion within the lower three groups for different sources. You know? So I can just give an idea for the the International Labor Organization got a very nice it is, um, a questionnaire. It's called the October Inquiry. So they were asking every year in a lot of countries, you know, how much were carpenters, uh, masons, uh, laborers, these or people in the administration were earning, yeah? And they were making all that comparable. So you got good series. And therefore, they say in construction, you got over eight or nine different, uh, you know, uh, occupations. Yeah? So you can get that data and try to get a dispersion. Also, a social tables available for those countries. Yeah? And all the data, okay? all the data official, which is on wages. So nice, that can give you this uh, information dispersion. For the group two, there is, I think I'm going to be using this industrial surveys available from those year on for those countries. And that gives you, what I've, I see is that gives you a good match the dispersion within manufacturing give you a good match for dispersion of occupation in the relatively skilled, okay? Particularly if you drop things like food and shoes yeah? and textile, okay? So that's nice because I can have an idea of dispersion here. The other thing, I, I haven't got yearly data, is benchmarks, but I also know by looking at the case of Brazil that that dispersion doesn't change much, yeah? Let's say over a decade. Just by having one observation, each decade is fine, hmm? because that tends to be stable. That dispersion within those occupational groups <coughs> tends to be stable, okay? I don't need annual series for that, okay? Uh, so basically, that's what I need to do, okay? Now they are the 40%, the middle 50, top 10, and of course, this total income will drop compared to when it was group four with 50%, now it's lower, that will go up, down, or, or down, we don't know, that will go up, okay, in that case. Um, so I've done that for Brazil and Argentina, Argentina and Brazil. And I'm going to show you how it looks like for Brazil, okay? Why Brazil? Well, because now I can 
check with other estimates, independent estimates. Yeah, people have done on Brazil. Okay, looking also at the shares. Uh, this is my shares, top 10, bottom 40%. Those dots are estimates by Luis Bertola and, and colleagues in Uruguay, the same, using the census in 1920 in Brazil. So you see this is well, spot on here, okay? This is the same, well they are, I think they are underestimating that one. I may be overestimating that one, but probably something in between is going to be right. But unfortunately only 1920 available, okay? So that gives you one point. The other uh, way of com comparing the plausibility of my series is what people like Pedro Sosa, uh, um, uh, Sosa and Morgan are doing for Brazil. They are correcting for the underestimation of the top 10% using the fiscal data and so on. So that's what they come up with, okay? This is a top 10% adjusted by, uh, based on fiscal data and national accounts, and that's the bottom 40%. Completely independent sources uh, and people. I mean, I haven't told them my series or anything like that, okay? So you see, it's not that bad. You know, judging by those comparisons, uh, that series, well, you say, well, that may tell something that actually happened, yeah? Um, and those are also, I wanted to show you what the uh, household genies are saying. If you calculate with the household genies, the top 10% in bottom, 40% for Brazil, that's what you get, okay? Okay, that's not too bad. That are the trends matching here. Of course, in terms of the levels, they are bound to be lower. Okay, because here I'm including a lot of things that are not included here. The same with the SOSA series. Um, I'll just finally let me go, go through more aggregate um, results. Now the region as a whole. I'm going to deal now with that Palma proposition. Remember, this is the relative stability of the 50% of the population across countries. So it doesn't matter where in which country you are, always the middle 50% decides five to nine, we get 50% of the income cake, okay? And that's supposed to be stable, okay, stable. To the extent that it is stable, you can use the Palma ratio as a measure of inequality, like the Gini, okay? More or less, we tell you the same story. Well, Palma is arguing that because that middle is stable, Actually, the, the, the distribution contest is something between the, the tails. Is that the, the middle gets what they want, the 50%, and then what is left is for graphs for the top and the bottom 50%. So that's why for Palma, the important things are the tails of the middle. The middle, you can assume them away because it is always stable, okay? So let's check if that is true. This is in the ca case of Palma. You see that the stability of the middle, this is cross country, 130, countries 2012 and then the middle you see this is stable okay this is a range from the income share of the bottom 40 percent low the this size one to four and you see where the changes are here top in the tail okay uh, now is that the same if whatever I can come up with for Latin America follows that pattern that's what I, I, I that's the result I'm getting okay uh, this is top 10%, bottom 40%, and that's the middle. Okay? So it doesn't look to be relative, relatively stable. Again, here is a point, I, I, this are not, so a, po a point uh, Branco was making before, is not, I'm not using surveys. <coughs> okay, I, I, I'm not using surveys for this, so I cannot say this is a test that this is not true, the stability, I'm doing something different, trying to approximate what Palma does with the surveys, yeah? But now look at, if you imagine placing a mirror here, and you can see that there's a reflection here, okay? So the, the contest seems to be happening here, not much here. So it's basically the story is that the, the bottom 40% gets the, what they usually get, you know, something to 12%, the minimum, and then whatever is left, what well, is for the others to, to decide, okay? Okay? So it's a, a story very different from the Palma story. Yeah? Uh, what about what is the, the survey telling us? Those are the surveys for the LA6 
because of the underestimation of the uh, top 10 percent, the middle 50 is higher than the top 10. Uh, but you see that the mirror, mirror effect is always is also here in the surveys. It's not a problem of me um, misestimating or doing something wrong with what I do. No, this is an artificial sort of mirror effect. No, that effect is all already in the, in the household surveys. Okay? Uh, and also using the historical data of Palma for Chile, let's say. Okay? Um, um, so the other sort of result I can check, I mean, related to the broader literature, is this what, what Jeffrey Williams and, and uh, Peter Linder called, Linder called the great leveling happening in the rich economies, you know, after basically in the middle period. Yeah? So is that, how does it compare with the LA6? That's Piketty's data and Atkinson, okay? That's the US and that's the UK. That's the top 10%. You see this um, radical <coughs> departure here in that period after the war, okay? But this is a well-known story, yeah? But what we can show now is that that didn't happen in Latin America. That Latin America, of those six countries, where inequality was as high as in the US here at the time of 1940, and now the US is actually catching up with Latin America in terms of concentration at the top, okay? So going up. Yeah? No leveling here. There are some cases of countries doing better, reducing inequality in that period. Uruguay, Argentina are two cases. But you don't see that as a common story sustained in time. Okay, it's not happening. Okay. Um, okay, and then the final thing I'm going to show you is a Palma-like ratio. Once you go an estimate of the top 10, bottom 40%, you can calculate the Palma ratio. In that case, you know, there that is a like. Because, because I'm not using survey data. Um, one, also one caveat here is that be, because of, there is no stability in the middle, so we got problems interpreting this as an inequality measure, the same as we would be doing with the Gini. Okay? But, you know, there is this trend here. So those are the six. You see the if you try to think about long term, this fluctuating but more or less constant level yeah, of the ratio, so think about inequalities more or less staying constant, and then rising trend over the, in the middle period, this is, let's say, consistent with the, the structural change, Kuznets, like uh, Lewis' story. And then, leveling off, high levels here in that final period and then the shared uh, decline at the end. Uh, and those are, that's <coughs> the, the, the pattern with the, the uh, household service genius, yeah, full data here. This is official. You see it's capturing that pattern here, is captured by that palm migration right. there. Now what about dispersion within the six countries? That's the dotted line in gray. So again, we got different things happening here. It's rising dispersion. This is coefficient of variation. Rising here in period one. Keep rising here and more. I mean, uh, diversity is higher here than here. And here we got countries converging so, so to a common inequality pattern. Yeah? So when people talk Latin America is a very high inequality story, they are basically this is referring to this. Okay. Uh, and this is dispersion with the uh, household service genes. You see, follow the same pattern. Follow the same pattern. Uh, now, now we can we have four. Oh, we got three measures of four measures of inequality and concentration. And now I can compare them. And that's what I want to do now. Argentina and Brazil. Again, same colors. Okay, that's the Palma. Okay. Of Palma like, and that the Palma like. That in the lighter blue is the Gini B that I already showed you before. Remember, this is the between groups Gini of the four groups, okay? Taking into account property income. And this in, in darker blue is the top 10%. 
So you see very clearly that whatever happens in that Gini B is dri being driven by what happened at the top, okay? Because those two metrics have, you know, tracking each other, and to an extent also what happened in the Palma ratio follows what happened in the top 10 percent, which is not surprising because. As we saw, the bottom 40% in Latin America tended to be very stable, you know, and all the movements were happening at the top. A exception is Mexico, okay, with the revolution in the, in the, over the 20s, yeah? But, so you see, those three indicators will tell you more or less the same story in terms of what happened to inequality over that period, yeah? Okay, you can use, and you can choose any of those and tell the story, okay? Uh, and if you aggregate the region, the six, that's what you get, same idea, okay? Those two, they track each other very well, and the Palma ratio is more sort of volatile, yeah? But the, the trends are there, you know? Now, what I just want to end the presentation showing you, now what happened to the genies just with the wages, okay? Remember that genie uh, three, with the three lower categories in green. Now the story is very different. That story, yeah, what happened on, only with labor income is very different. And what it's showing you is that there was very little changes over, I mean, the longer term in that inequality in wages. Okay? Okay? You see, uh, what you see here, those trends rising and then staying stable is different from that, the trends you get, and in some cases they are in opposite. Direction. So, again, this is something that needs explanation, but at least now we got metrics that look at different things in terms of the, what happened to inequality. So, conclusion. Uh, diversity. Country diversity is something that needs to be taken into account. Yeah? It's not valid to think about in, uh, Latin America as, as a high inequality country, and that's it. Yeah, from the colonial times, I mean, that's very simplistic uh, story. Period two seems to be the one with the more diversity uh, and because of the complexity of the transformations as well that makes sense. And I was, I was always thinking about this, the, uh, paraphrasing the Ana Karenina's starting lines, yeah? So, it's, uh, so in terms of inequality, so, so it will be equal countries are all alike, okay? Every unequal country is unequal in its own way, which seems to be what happened in Latin America. Uh, persistence, high concentration, yes, 52% over the period, it is high, 13%. This is Palma ratio five, five, very high, okay? That is equivalent, if there is a stability in the middle, in the middle, equivalent to the Gini 0.5, the Gini with the whole distribution, all data, survey data, not level enough, no consistency with the Palma proposition. Um, so that means that the Palma ratio, all preservation here, is basically an income concentration measure in, in the case of those six countries because it's driven by the top 10%. Finally, answering the, the question of the paper, is that the story of two tails? I would, I would think yes, it is the two tails, but not in the Palma sense, okay? Of homogeneous middle, heterogeneous tail, no. It's the story of two tails because that's where the distributional contest is happening. It, it is between the top and the middle, not, uh, sorry, be, yeah, the top and the middle is not happening between the top and the bottom, okay? Different thing, but it's still, I would think, story of two tails. Okay? But thank you very much for, for coming. Yeah.